I'm Brodor, and this is Why We Game. You're listening to the Origin Special Part 2. I'm going to assume that you listened to Part 1, so if the organization of things doesn't make any sense, you're going to figure it out. Let's get right into it with Leo from Super Show. I was utterly fucking impressed every time I walked into the gaming slash exhibitor hall and the Super Show card game had a huge following of people. Well, huge is relative compared to the other games that were at the show, but they had a big representation. People were super excited, stoked to be playing the game. They were in costume, they were energized. It was really, really interesting. I had never heard of the game, but anyway, I'm gonna turn things over to Leo. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here with Loudmouth Leo Larynx, that's right, baby. So Loudmouth Leo Larynx, what the hell is Super Show? Super Show, the game is the number one wrestling game in the world where you can live out all your wildest wrestling fantasies without ever taking a chair shot. Are the matches scripted? No, they are not. <laughs> they are not. They are not. Not like your regular professional wrestling. Yes, we do set up bookings. We have people. We had a world championship <laughs> change hands here today after the champion defended his belt for 10 times over the course of the past 365 days. One full calendar year. That's right. I'm an old man, but I've also been in the hobby industry a long time. Your show presence, not only are you like right at the opening in prime real estate, but also your tables are packed. They're almost constantly packed. I have never seen this game in a game store. How is it that you have such a huge popular following and I've never heard of you guys? We've been around since 2014. We started this game here at Origins and Gen Con in 2014, selling out of Chinese food containers with a <laughs> sticker slapped on them. Two dice, two decks, and a dream. And here we are seven years later with over 400 superstars in the game, all of our different competitors. We work with independent wrestlers. We have the likes of AJ Styles, Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, some of these names that are in the WWE and AEW respectively at this current point in time. Some of them world champions, not like an LFF world champion like I hope to be one day. 2019 play of the year, one half of the greatest tag team ever, <laughs> loud and grumpy. Grump, I miss you, baby. That's right. That's a very popular card game whose publisher is not here. They do not have the draw that you guys have. I've never seen them have the energy that you guys have. If I was brand new to the gaming hobby, I would say that that game's not doing very well and you guys are fucking crushing. Oh, absolutely. Right now we have a new player event. All the people have either learned the game this weekend or have learned it in the past month. We have about 19 people playing in that event. 19 new players. I told a gentleman three years ago at Gen Con on a Friday afternoon, he played in our 96 man event on Saturday, came in fourth place with all of our veteran players. This can be a competitive game, but you just stepping to the ring green as hell can walk in and try to become a champion and you withstand a chance. Where can people find you? Because after hearing this energy, if they're not at the show or they're not doing the con circuit, where do they get Super Show? So we do have some distribution through GTS at the moment. We're in talks with another distribution company after this weekend. But you can find us on supershowthegame.com and order from us directly. You can order two-player box sets. You can order enough to play tag team, four-way dances. You could have a six-man. We had an 80-man over-the-top battle royal at an event that we hosted in Cleveland two years ago, the Grand Gathering. Not only is it thematically wrestling, you guys have a game that is designed to also mechanically mimic a wrestling style large event. That's right. Anything that you can see in a wrestling ring, we try to replicate. We have lumberjack matches, steel cage, ring of fire, tables, ladders, and chains. Oh my. We have a bird cage, a liger's dead match, a, fuse, a spin on what people would see in the WWE as a hell in a cell or an elimination chamber style match. We also have our players who dress up as themselves and have themselves in the game. Like this gentleman over here, he's wearing a cheetah skin blanket. He calls himself the cheetah and he's teaming up with La Penguin. Their tag team is the Animal Kingdom. 
We have the brain here, the smartest man in the LFF with his sequin jacket. Another man wearing sequins, he's Mr. Las Vegas, Eddie Fury. We have the Lucha Maniacal Uber star right there with a star on his face wearing a luchador mask. Uh, you also have, at, at, at risk of sounding crass, an uncomfortably attractive wrestling lady. That is Miss Southern Belle. She can put- You're talking about me! Oh! Are you kidding me? She uh, was the first women's heavyweight champion, which is a fact and well, no. powerful achievement. She can wrestle with the best of them. So John, very dapper, suits on point, looking sharp. Wealthy. You're a manager, is that what you yeah. do here? You need a television in your home, sir. I am the general manager of the Legendary Fighting Federation, and some people are rich, but I am wealthy. I have accumulated oh. mass amounts of riches and stacked them up to the heavens! To so, the and heavens. now I'm wealthy, capital W. Everything I have is custom made. You know what? The thing for you is, if you shine those shoes when you step into my ring, then maybe one day you could win in the LFF. If I had aspirations to be somebody in the LFF, and I wanted to start training, where do I begin? If I want to become wealthy with a capital W. Start by getting a job. That'll be the first thing I would say. They pay, you know, a, a fair wage according to the government. Second of all, shine the shoes. Third of all, get a demo, and not from Pat Mulligan, because he's an idiot. Get a demo from one of the smart people, and as you can see, Slim Pickens. Well, John, thank you very, very much. You're welcome. You're I, welcome. I hope You're welcome. to someday yes. Yes. to aspire absolutely. to be wealthy, even absolutely. if my W is absolutely. inferior. Absolutely, absolutely. Leo, one more time, where do I buy the game? That is supershowthegame.com. S-U-P-E-R-S-H-O-W, thegame.com. We are also available through GTS Distribution, but you can apply to us directly. And if you are a retailer, please send us an email through our contact info on our website. We work directly with retailers as well with wholesale orders. Thank you. Thank you very much. Something that is ubiquitous across the pond that is much more rare here are gaming clubs. And so I was pretty excited to speak with Jen from the National Community of Gamers about what they were doing and super impressed with the cool tables that they put together. <laughs> All right, so this is Brodo again. I'm here with the National Community of Gamers. I'm speaking with Jen, and the thing that brought me over is, if you're familiar with my video, when I refer to Hot Smurf on Smurf Action, this is the game that I'm talking about. Totally unique, looks like a complete homebrew, a delightful presentation, but every table here for the NCG has something amazing going on. Whether it's the Smurfs, whether it's Ghostbusters, or whether it's the two tables going on in the back, their presentation is, if you will excuse an old man for using a new expression, on point. Jen is gonna give us a little bit of a breakdown. Here's the other thing too, you guys know how I feel about redheads, so I can't say it was the games that brought me over here entirely. So Jen, how are you? I am very good, thank you. I, um, so what is the National Community of Gamers? Well, it started out as a bunch of people that love to play games and want to play games with other people. And it is national. So we're here in Columbus, Ohio for Origins, but how far of a national reach do you guys have? Oh, honestly, I don't know where our farthest one is, but funny thing, it started out as North Coast Gamers. Okay. Because we were from the Cleveland area, but we had so much of an interest that we're like, wait a minute, we can't stay to just North Ohio. So we became national community. Now I hear that Cleveland rocks, is that true? <laughs> yes, it okay, does. Okay, <laughs> excellent. But so do, do you guys have, is it cloisters, is it cells, is it one big, like a, a Discord community? Like how, how so, do you guys interact with one mm -hmm. another? So we do have events, um, we do have a Facebook page. We do try to get together at least once a month. We'll just pick a local place, whether it's a personal home or a place like a, a restaurant or a bar, and we just get together and play games. You guys obviously have a penchant for putting together or putting on a presentation for miniature gaming, I'm going to assume that you're not exclusively miniature games. Oh, no. 
miniatures, board games, card games. About the only thing we don't touch on is video games. So it's all analog. Respect. I mean, I don't Old not school. yeah, not to disrespect the video gamer. It's just not it's just not my scene. If someone wants to get in contact with you and learn more, where do they find you guys? Um, they can do a search for us on Facebook. Well, thank you so much. I have distracted enough from the Smurf battle. I'm going to let you get back to it. But first, excellent mask. Oh, thank you. Uh, you got, take care. Thank Mortal you. Combat. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Apparel is something that is always intriguing to me when you go to shows because for me, you see such a wide variety of things that I'm really, really into and conversely things that I don't fucking get, right? So it's really cool to walk around and see how these different subcultures of the industry blend. And then when you see something like Hairbrain Design, which isn't really gaming stuff at all, but then is totally, totally in our wheelhouse as far as pop culture references are concerned. But also... They have a game, and I didn't even know they had a game because it was their apparel that drew me over, called Shit for Brains. Then I stopped by Hairbrained Design Apparel and More from Chicago, Illinois. Did it slick because it's not exactly gaming related in the traditional sense as a lot of the booths that you would see, but it's filled with underpants. And when I say underpants, I mean kitschy underpants. Like, uh, you've got Big Trouble in Little China underpants and granny panties with the Golden Girls on them. But my favorite, the Ron Swanson Meat Tornado Boxer Shorts, which I will definitely be bringing home for myself. The coolest thing, though, is the Little Caesars Master Splinters Pizza Place logo that they did. Dude, it's killer. Anyway, I'm here with Anthony, and Anthony's going to give us the breakdown on Hairbrained. Hairbrained is, there's three of us. It's uh, me, my friend Jesse, and my friend Amanda. Yeah, we're from Chicago, and we design uh, t-shirts, underwear, pins, and uh, we have our own game, Ship for Brains. My podcast, as a general rule, is a long-form interview show where I talk to people who are gamers uh -huh. who go pro. You guys are gamers that are also graphic designers? Right. right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's a trivia game, and it's something that we wanted to do for a long time. We would always play bar trivia, but we always hated questions that were super boring or like just didn't interest us. So we decided to make a trivia game all about sex, drugs, crime, bodily functions, cults, all the edgier stuff of life. Forgive the clumsy analogy, but essentially it's a cards against humanity meets trivia. Sure, yeah. Is that, is yeah, that, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. As, a, as a former retailer, elevator pitch is yeah, always first and foremost. Favorite. You guys also are really, I mean, you are on it. You've got this really great, because Elizabeth Montgomery is like my childhood crush, and so you've got this Agatha all along bewitched t-shirt, which is brilliant. My personal favorite, though, is the big Lebowski, Michael Jordan jumping, but he's got the bowling ball and the white Russian. Dude, those are absolutely fantastic. Now, the Izod Loki, it gets some love, but Agatha all along, <laughs> super choice. So I gotta ask, if people wanna look at your stuff or they wanna check out Shit for Brains, uh, where are they going to find you on that series of tubes called the interwebs? They can go to hairbraindesign.com. That's H-A-R-E, braindesign.com. Do you guys do consignment work? Like if somebody reached out to you and wanted to do t-shirts or pins or something, is that something you guys do or is it all original work? For the most part, it's all original work, but we do have slow periods of the year where we will take on some commission work. Gotcha. So you're, you are not starving, but hungry artists. <laughs> Always hungry. How do you pay the bills? Selling underwear, slinging, slinging underwear. All right. So this is your job job. You guys don't do anything else. How old are you? <laughs> I'm 38. Fuck off, you are not 38 years old. Sorry, I've got a potty mouth. You are not 38 years old. Dude, I would have pegged you for 28 if a day. Seriously? 
38? Yeah, 38. You Born in 82. You don't have kids, do you? I do. I have two kids. Jesus Christ, how do you do it? You you suck adrenochrome, don't you? Uh, that's why I have the kiss. <laughs> so that you're just slow yeah, drip. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Lance, I got to tell you, you guys have been a blast. I definitely am going to need me some of those Ron Swansons for 38, 36. I don't know what range that is. And I'm going to need one of them extra large splinters, please. Okay, will do. Thanks, Let me get man. That for you. I appreciate your time. <laughs> Now, being ignorant and biased, I oftentimes will walk around a, a convention exhibit hall and I'll see a booth that I don't really understand what their place is in the industry. And so, of course, I have to go over and ask questions. And I was pleasantly surprised when I spoke to Karen and Jason from Cruise Planners about D&D on the open water. All right, so I'm here with Kara and Jason. Kara, right? Okay. Kara and Jason from Cruise Planners here at Origins 2021. And they have a particularly interesting booth because they're not hawking a thing. They're hawking an experience. And that experience is a gaming cruise. Now, they also, on their Norwegian Cruise Line sign, they have some people's names that you might recognize like, I don't know, Keith Baker and, well, a few others. But I'm going to let Kara and Jason explain to you what it is precisely that they do and why they're here at Origins. Well, thank you so very much. So we do board game and Dungeons and & Dragons cruises where we basically you get on a boat, you enjoy what a cruise is while getting to play some awesome games. Should we start off first talking about Dungeons & Dragons D3 since that's coming up first? Yeah, so okay. uh, upcoming in March, we have our inaugural cruise. It's the D3 at sea. Um, it's going to be with Royal Caribbean's Allure of the Seas. Eight years in a row, voted best ship in the world. One of the largest ships in the world. Um, we have celebrity DMs on board. Uh, B. Dave Walters, Mark Meir, Tanya DePass, um, tons and tons of others. Amazing sponsors, Die Hard Dice, Talon and Claw, Eldritch Foundry. Every single passenger aboard gets a swag bag put together. Uh, that they'll get on the opening night with free gifts, amazing gifts from our sponsors. Uh, you'll get 16 hours of full gaming time on, on board on D3 at Sea in four four-hour sessions. And then the rest of the time, it's pretty free form. We've got some special events planned, that type of thing. There's going to be a D&D improv night where Mark Mears running it, and all the other DMs are going to improv characters, and all the passengers get to watch and enjoy. It's a D&D centric cruise. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's a convention on the ocean. Kind, kind of. We don't we don't charter the whole boat. Um, it's a private event on board the boat. So you know, we're, we're looking at maybe somewhere around 100 players, that type of thing, and it'll be it'll be amazing. Like I, I'm excited for it. So but Carrie, you also do board game events? Yes, so we have uh, B3 coming up at, it's um, January 2023. Board game beaches and brews. It's very, very free form. Come and go as you please, 24 seven gaming. We have our own room, 200 plus games in our gaming library. Play whatever you want. We do have some other events going on. So we have a murder mystery, an escape room, things like that to kind of keep it going. We have uh, nightly events. We have things where you can play prototype games, games that aren't published yet, which is really cool. All sorts of things, very free form. Come and do as much as you want or as little as you want. Enjoy the cruise. Enjoy just the feeling of being at sea, playing some games. It's really cool. And if somebody's not here at the show, I presume that we can find you at alloutvacations.com. Exactly. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about each cruise specifically, you can check out B3 at Sea, which is the board games, or D3 at Sea, which is the Dungeons and Dragons one. So as someone who is relatively handsome and charismatic by gaming standards, how do I apply to become a dungeon master? You talk to this man. Yeah, so you would reach out to me. Um, you can uh, reach me via the D3 at Sea website. Like I said, we, as of right now, at least for D3 at Sea, we're completely full up on DMs. Uh, but, you know, this is just the first. Yeah, of, of course you're full there's, up. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's more coming. Yeah, so. I mean, you could put me in another DM in a phone booth with a knife, and that would be my application <laughs> process. I'm in. Yeah, Done. yeah. Well, don't worry. Yeah, in fact, other... I always carry two, so I'm in. <laughs> anyway, uh, I know I sound like a crazy person. Well, guys, I thank, love it. thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate You're it. You're so Definitely. welcome. Thank it's you for, for speaking to us. Us. Take care. I didn't have the time to talk to these guys at Gen Con because it was too busy. Oh, I'm going to use this excuse again later in this episode. What a fucking hack. Anyway, I, I, I was there. It was the indie. 
I saw the Indie Game Design Network booth and it was being run by Brandon and Matt from Wet Ink Games. And I had the opportunity to slip in there and talk to them about never going home. And I need to apologize to Matt because I didn't, I, I stepped all over his lines. I, I was an asshole. So if you saw my Facebook video that I did, and I know that my brother, and I know that Joe, and I know that Jorma at least did, because I got them hardcovers of Never Going Home. I am at the Indie Game Developer Network booth, which you know in association with Pete Petrusha because of Chew and Rest in Pieces. But yeah, my Gen Con go home, my takeaway, the game that I was most stoked about was Never Going Home. And Brandon here had me, all he said was World War I mythos. And I was like, okay, here's my wallet. You just take what you need out of there (laughs) and we'll just move on. What's unique about the system is that in, in the tradition of the modern zeitgeist, if you'll forgive the pretension, their game is st- it's, it's slick, it's streamlined, and it's really made for a, a, an easier mechanic that lends itself to a more narrative story. So I just picked up another game from them called Tenibria that uses the same system. So I would like you guys, the designers, Brandon and Matthew, to kind of break down for me what is your system and, and, and what sets it apart. Yeah, absolutely. So the plus one system Uh, uses standard six-sided dice and standard playing cards. The great thing about each one of these games is that the dice mechanic system will always stay the same. However, in other versions of the Plus One system, the card representations can be modified. So in Never Going Home, our cards represent your humanity, they represent your memories, and what makes you human. Whereas in Tenebria, which is post-apocalyptic, fall of Rome, setting your cards represent the resources that you're using to rebuild a city and uh, a civilization in central europe mechanically the dice system is effectively building dice pools and you can every single time you build a dice pool you have to decide am i going to augment this dice uh, pool before i roll or after i roll and you have the ability to make those changes on the fly with every instance of a die roll so in Never Going Home, let's say you have you start making your dice pool, you're trying to get a five or a six as a success, and you have a target number of successes you're trying to get. Let's say I'm a mechanic. I have two dice in my mechanic skill, and I'm trying to you know, get this, en- this truck engine to turn over. So maybe I need two successes. Well, yeah, I can get two successes on two dice, but if, you know, if I had more, maybe it would be better. Well, each one of our skills is tied to one of our three attributes in the game, and the attributes represent how many times you can manipulate that die roll, dice pool, on every time you roll those dice. So the stronger I am, the more I can manipulate strength checks. Yes, exactly. And if you have a lot in your athletic skill and you happen to have a lot of brawn, then yeah, you're probably not going to fail a lot of strength-based things. However, sometimes you may not even have the skill, so it's one of those, am I smart enough to have a good idea thing. If you have a lot of smarts, you can just straight up buy the skill, and then you can add dice to it, so you can say, okay, well now I can fiddle around with this engine enough that maybe I can get it to work. You're not gonna be as good as someone who's trained in mechanics, but you might be able to make your two successes that you need to get it. Now my understanding when I was speaking to, do you prefer Matt or Matthew? Uh, I, either way, either way. Okay, so I, Matt's easier for me to say because sure. I have a fat tongue. <laughs> when I was talking to Matt yesterday, and I ended up purchasing Tenebri of today, you were explaining to me that with your system, a friend of yours said, hey, I like what you're doing, but I want to do a different mechanic. So unlike with Never Going Home, the cards representing humanity, sanity, recollection, etc. In Tenebria, they rec- they represent resources. Exactly right. And you have sort of a, uh, I don't want to say RTS, real-time strategy sort of thing, but you have a home base, for a lack of a better explanation, yes. that you are building. Yeah, I don't even have to explain it. You're explaining it so well. Like, <laughs> yes, yes, you've done it right. Uh, well, that's because, dude, I'm a nerd. I'm, I totally geeked out on your stuff. I really, really did. What are your respective roles with Wet Ink? So, uh, I'm Brandon. I'm the business director, and... You know, uh, one of the system designers, uh, Matt, is our creative director yeah. and also a system designer. We bounce a lot of ideas off of each other as we start developing these things. Never going home and the plus one 
it was kind of a derivative of a system that we used for Wild Skies, our first project, and we kind of simplified it, and then we said, okay, how do we want this to work? How do we want this to be more accessible to the average gamer? And so it was a lot of like sitting in coffee shops and sending messages back and forth, so. People who listen to my show have heard me say this more than one time, but as people who are gamers who went pro, it seems to me that dedication, consistency, and meeting deadlines are key to being successful in getting your game off the ground. Uh, they certainly, it doesn't hurt to meet all of those points. <laughs> uh, sometimes delays are acceptable, you know, like especially with the crowdfunding kind of thing, people that got into it want the thing. So you, you can come to them and say like, we need a little bit more time to do it. And they're like, yes, we still want it, take more time to do it. You know, there's not, at the scale that we're at, there's not like uh, shareholders to appease, only fans, you know? Yeah. And yeah. fans are in your corner already because they're your fans. Yeah, Kickstarter to me is like polyamory. Now, I am not polyamorous <laughs> myself. I know many people that are polyamorous. And the thing is, everybody to a person says communication is key. Yes. Kickstarter is the same way where you can screw so you can even shit the bed. You yeah. just have to tell people, hey, I, by the way, I shit the bed. And well, here's what's going on. And a lot of times, especially we've seen this in the industry, especially over the past eight months, a little year or so, when shipping delays are happening, resource delays are happening, you have shortages of containers going back to China, you have shortages of staff, ports have been closed, stuff like that. Right. Every single one of these steps along the way delays every other single step along the way. So we've had pallets of stuff sitting in the factory in China right now for one of our projects, the only project we've ever printed in China that's just waiting, waiting to be put in a container. We'll we, we have stuff in uh, for our Into the Weird and Wild project that we did with Charles Ferguson Avery. We've, we're printing that with a domestic printer that we used for Never Going Home, and normally that was a two-week turnaround. It ended up turning into like a three-and-a-half-month turnaround because they just they don't have enough staff in the print shop. They don't have enough staff in the warehouse. They don't. So it's like every step along the way is some level of delay but you're right communication is key and we can say in an update hey here's what's going on and every once in a while you'll get someone who say, says well I want my book I'm like we want your book too <laughs> we, we would love to get it out of this right yeah people don't understand my mentor in the hobby industry this guy Dave Wallace who's been a retailer for 40 years he told me once about an exchange where, you know, someone wanted, I wanted to buy cheaper games from the game store and literally told him, well, why don't you get a job like everybody else so you can sell this product to me at a lower price? Mm. I, it just, it boggles the mind, the depth of ignorance that people can engage in yeah. when so much of this is, because of globalization, Absolutely. so much of it's out of your control. 100%. And we are extremely grateful for every single one of our supporters that has put us in this position to do bigger and better things. Our very first project was Wild Skies Europa Tempest, which it was really just me and Matt doing a lot of writing, but we knew a lot of artists, friends, who did a lot of work on spec. And these are professional artists in the industry who've worked in the industry for decades doing art for spec on spec just because they liked us. And once it was successful, we managed to pay them, and which number one, hey, if you're ever thinking about doing this, one, don't ever work for free. Two, if you are going to contract with somebody, pay them. Don't flake out on that because your reputation in this industry is the only thing you have to stand on. Yeah. You know, can you deliver? Can you make the people that you work with happy? And can you make your fans happy? So, yes, all of that said, our first project, we kind of like punched above our weight a little bit, but it allowed us to do something else, like go and uh, license some art and start doing never going home which allowed us to meet Stephen Wu who developed Tenebria and our success with never going home in 2019 and with other things really led to our relationship with Banana Chan and Sen Fung Lim to do Zhang Shi Blood in the Banquet Hall like these are things everything built on on itself and we're doing bigger and better things so Matthew and I will never disparage our fans or supporters we are absolutely grateful because we would not be in this situation without them. Your booth is definitely picking up, so a couple quick last questions. If people want to buy your games, where do they find you guys? 
we have a website at wetinkgames.com, and that will link you to various places where you can purchase the games. And you ship internationally? We do. We will invoice for international shipping because, hell, it's expensive. Uh, but it's the it's the same thing. We, we'll link you to any press revolution where you can buy physical copies of our books. We'll link you to Drive Through RPG if you want print on demand. If you're international, Drive Through RPG is probably your best bet because you do print on demand and they will print regionally. One last question: Where do I find the artist who did Never Going Home? He runs a shop called Feral Indie Studios. I think it's Feral Ind- It's got an itch.io. I can't give you the whole URL, but he's on itch.io at Feral Indie Studios, and that's Charles Ferguson Avery. Because he's not exactly Ralph Bakshi, but he is Bakshian in style. So if you've seen Wizards, you know what I'm talking about. I'm nodding. I'm nodding along. (laughs) Again, I don't have to say anything. You've done the whole interview. Uh, Matt, Brandon, I had a blast meeting you guys at Gen Con. I love never going home, but I want to let you guys get back to it because I think these people may want to give you some money. All right. Oh, (laughs) real quick. You can also find Charles on Twitter. He's Charlie Rat Bastard. That will go right to his Twitter page. Um, or at Charlie Fer- Fergaves. F-E-R-G-A-V-E-S. It'll go to Twitter. But as Matt said, he is on uh, uh, Twitch.io. Yeah, there's all kinds of places you can find him. Guys, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. What's that? You have a creature caster banner. You don't have anything in your booth but one display case of unbelievably kick-ass miniatures, most of which are unpainted. And the ones that were, were done to studio quality. But you also have a toy soldier machine? Say no more. Again, I'm walking down the hall and I see something called SioCast, presuming that I'm, I'm pronouncing it correctly, the miniature manufacturing technology. And based on my limited experience doing spin casting and pressure casting, working with resin, working with metal, and as you know, if you're a regular listener, you know how much I get blood in it for some toy soldiers. They have this machine that is, I think it makes molds and it makes figs, but I'm going to let Peter, the man behind Creature Caster, explain to you what this machine does. Yeah, so I call it CO cast. I probably am pronouncing it wrong. It might be. It might be. Um, how, how did you say it? I Is said it? sio. Sio. Yeah, I, I've yeah. Had it, heard it both ways. I, I think have it's a, a clumsy tomato, Midwestern tongue. I think so. it's a tomato tomato type <laughs> situation there. Yeah. So we use the uh, CO cast or sio cast in our manufacturing. What it is is a injection machine that goes into a soft mold, and it is sort of used to replace uh, hand poured resin or sort of like that spin cast resin or spin cast metal. So it's sort of a new technology that is heading out to replace those things. You're seeing it being adopted by a lot of manufacturers right now. You see it with Reaper, Infinity has just started using the technology, and we're using it for a lot of our smaller figures because. We want infantry to be really durable, and the material is incredibly durable. So, Besides durability, I also see that it is non-toxic and recyclable? Yeah, that's right. So basically all of the material, all the waste that we get, we're able to reuse all of it. So we just put it right back into the hopper. The machine melts the plastic at sort of a low temperature, and then it uses a combination of a air pressure injection and a vacuum in order to completely fill the molds. So it's, it's a pretty slick system. It takes maybe two seconds to inject the mold and then about three minutes of cooling and then you're able to demold it right away. This makes the molds and does the pouring? It only does the injection. Okay. The molds are made through basically a regular vulcanizing process. Ah, so, I gotcha. Yeah, okay. you can use any vulcanizer to do it. Um, CO Cast does manufacture something called the CO Press, which is their extremely well calibrated vulcanizer. That is the one we use for our Creature Caster, and we've never had any uh, any issues with the calibration of the mold. I have to wonder what you guys are doing here at the show, because you've got a, a beautiful display case uh, with a couple of painted models and some unpainted models in remarkable detail. You've got a nice little table set up with some displays of the different pigments of plastic pellet that you can use for printing, some different size models, but you're not actually selling product to the consumer. Is this an advertising opportunity for Creature Caster, or yes. are you trying to sell machines. Well, we were invited here by SEOCast because they couldn't travel to the convention because they're in Europe and COVID has basically blocked a lot of travel. 
So we were invited down. There's actually supposed to be a machine in the booth. That's how easy it is to set up this machine. We were going to set it up in one day, and we were going to be using the machine to produce models in the booth live for everybody. But that shipment got locked in Chicago. All of CreatureCaster's stock got locked in Chicago. Uh, apparently, there's three other vendors who have no stuff either because it's all trapped in Chicago. That's so, brutal. Yeah, so Is it a shipping container thing I, or trucking? Or I yes. think it's a shipping container coming off the train. So it ah. seems to be the trains that have caused the issue. So we don't have anything to sell, but our web store is open and we are offering uh, bundle deals and free shipping for the convention as well. So there theoretically would have been toy soldiers here for me to buy? There would have been Dude, many, I'm many fucking crying. I'm, 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 my eyes are watering. I was, I was pretty your, heartbroken your as well. Because your stuff is brilliant. Right? Thank you. I got turned on when I was still a retailer working for a miniature market. I got turned on uh, by this guy who does hobby time in the murder basement, Heath, and he basically is like, have you heard of Creature Caster? I was like, I have not. Any which way, if I'm going to buy this machine, what am I looking at? So this machine is 49,000 USD. It's not for your average hobbyist, it's definitely for a manufacturer. How much of that money goes to the CCP? What is the CCP? The, the Chinese Communist Party. Is this manufacturer? Zero, zero dollars goes Wait a to minute. the CCP. So if I've got 50 grand, I can have a machine that doesn't give money to the CCP and I can produce miniatures in my hometown. That is correct. And you could produce, you know, a mold will last for basically 300 pulls. Uh, you basically can fit like eight miniatures into a mold, producing about 40 or doing 40 injections in an hour. So someone else can do the math on that, but thousands of miniatures in an hour. Is there anything else that you guys want to plug for Creature Caster while I've got you here? Anything like uh, on the website, specials or whatever that I need to know about? Yeah, so we have our Judgment Eternal Champions Kickstarter. That completed at the end of uh, April, beginning of May, I believe. And we're launching the Pledge Manager uh, next week or the week after. So anyone who wants to late back, they can get in for the Judgment Eternal Champions. We also just released a really special model for Creature Caster, which is the Maltique. Uh, we're donating half of our proceeds from that to cancer. The model itself was designed with our friend uh, Michelle Farnsworth. She's actually got a terminal brain cancer, so it's sort of a very uh, meaningful miniature for us. And yeah, love people support that. Right on. Well, Peter, thank you so much for your time. I hope you guys have as successful a show as you can, man. Thank you, Mike. Really appreciate you dropping by. So inspiration struck me real quick before I left with Peter, and he said he didn't mind answering these questions about the CO cast. I'm going to say it your way. All right. Uh, I'm going to pronounce <laughs> it that way until, until I'm corrected by the manufacturer. I was asking you, you know, 3D printer technology is a big thing right now, and that technology is advancing and becoming more cost-effective for the consumer. But it's also becoming more... Uh, it's also becoming a more reasonable investment for the manufacturer. How is this advantageous to doing large bulk 3D printing? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you're looking at 3D printing as a manufacturer, it's still a very slow process. So, you know, this is going to be much faster as a manufacturer in order to produce that volume. So if you're doing anything at volume right now, 3D printing is still not a viable alternative to, you know, more traditional manufacturing. And so I would say as a manufacturer, this is fantastic. As a consumer, you know, the ability to get 3D printed models is, is always growing. It's a fantastic technology. Again, for most people, they don't mind waiting 18 hours to do a print, right? That's not a big deal. But there's a lot of things with 3D printing that a consumer may not be happy with. It is, again, it is time consuming. You do need a technological expertise. You are dealing with a lot of chemicals right now, and it's not really, very well advertised about how harmful some of those chemicals are, both for the environment and for the consumer. That, I would say, certainly is the speed with which you can produce, obviously, is superior. But the other thing, if I'm a manufacturer, I would absolutely promote the idea that my material is recyclable and non-toxic just to say, look, I care about the environment in addition to having these other advantages. Exactly. That was a huge deal for us as to why we wanted to you know, look at this technology as opposed to what we've been traditionally doing. Uh, resin produces like quite a lot of waste and it made us feel really, really good that we're able to use a product that 
we have no waste that comes out of our facility from using this. So. What kind of cleaning process do we need to do? Do I have to bathe it like I would my resin 3D printed stuff? No, so this is essentially a plastic like you would get you know, with resin. Um, you're, you know, you're just trimming it with your hobby knife and with files and things like that, and then you're gluing it together. For us, as a manufacturer, we spend, for every 3D print we do, we spend about a week cleaning and polishing and making that 3D print perfect, right? So if you can imagine as a consumer, if you were to do that for an infantry unit, you know, you're going to be spending 10 weeks getting that model as clean as we do, right? So, you know, I think there's certain people 3D printing is going to be great for. I think it's an exciting addition to the hobby, but I still think manufacturing has uh, has a role to play for consumers okay. and will still be there in the future. Yeah, it's a long way off. Do you guys sell STL files? Right now, we don't sell STL files. It's something that we are discussing uh, internally because, again, we see it as a great dude, addition. Dude, that's the magic, right? Because I don't want to print on my resin printer th the whole models. I want hands, weapons, heads, backpacks, accoutrement, if you will. Yes. I just want kit to glue onto guys, and that's the shit I want to make myself. Yes, yeah, and we're looking at that, and we're looking at making models specifically that are that are easier to print out on your home printer. So, you know, for us, we use an Envision Tech printer. That printer costs sixty thousand um, dollars. Most people aren't going to have a sixty thousand dollar printer in their home, and there is a definitely a noticeable difference. Yeah, I can't, the, I can't, I can't imagine like anything that that significant price differential has an impact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, will the printing technology be there sooner or later in the home that you're printing as nicely as we are? Yes, I do believe that. And even right now, you're still getting beautiful miniatures at home, and we are going to expand into that market as well. Well, Peter, again, thank you a second time. The booth that I spent the most time at was Skeleton Key Games, mostly because I was ogling Ed's artwork. But I spent a lot of time talking to them just about gaming and about Ed's art style, and it was really, really fascinating. I really hope I get the opportunity to sit down with him and do long form because he was just, his work's just fucking brilliant. So if you listen to the Gen Con special, you know that my hot pick of Gen Con was Never Going Home by Wet Ink Games. My pick here for Origins being on the sales floor in the vendor hall, right, is Skeleton Key Games. I'm here with Ed, who is an extremely gifted artist and graphic designer who's got a few different products here. I want to start off with your hand-drawn scrolls that you do, because that's really what attracted me to your booth. I started the Arcane Scroll Works line about four years ago. I was really, really um, a big fan of using props at the table, and I wanted to find something that had not been done before. And so I just started kind of going through this list of ideas and looking things up, and I stumbled upon, hey, you know, in the game, there are literal documents of these spells, right, that you can find. And I'm like, I've never seen anybody really make tangible versions. So I started playing with that. I started with a single Kickstarter that was one scroll, kind of Cthulhu themed, and it went gangbusters. So we decided to dive in, like, all the way. You know, right now we're, we've got first through fourth level arcane spells, few divine spells and druid spells. We're presently kickstarting the fifth and sixth level spells, but just creating that tangible thing. And they're just so fun to interpret the written rules into a cool visual for each spell. You are also a writer and game designer. You have a campaign book that I also went gaga over for Mork Boar. Can you tell us about the Masticating Gate? Yeah, the folks behind Mork Borg opened up a third party license, and it's a game that I had been playing, and I just jumped on it. I had this concept where there are these demons that were defeated. Uh, millennia ago, trapped in this uh, place of darkness, and they found a way out, but it is through a thing called the Masticator Gate. So as the demons come out, they're chewed up and basically unmade. They're spit out into the world of Morkborg, where they reform. So we have this accompanying uh, deck that goes with the campaign called the Endless Demon Deck. And what you do is you draw three cards, and it literally completes an illustration and all of the stats for a unique demon. There will be three unique demons, 
as the nemesis in each adventure in the campaign. So each playgroup is going to have a slightly different experience because the big baddies that they're facing are going to be all different each time. And I, I just, I really love the interactiveness of, of using the cards to create your foe. And then also within the book, there are places where you would overlay a card. So there might be like a headless demon that didn't fully form. So you'll just lay one of the torso cards in the book and it will fill out your stats of the headless demon. And, and the other stats are kind of there in the book. So if you get too close to it, you're getting blinded because it's like spraying blood out of its severed neck into your eyes, right? What did you discover first, art or gaming? Wow. Um, you know what? I was a child when I discovered both. Like, I immediately started coloring outside the lines and, I guess, art. Because by the time I was six, I think we scrapped coloring books and just went to blank paper. And I was about eight the first time I played D&D back in 1979. Sounds like that those two great tastes that taste great together have always been part of your diet? 100%. Like, I went into graphic design, um, and then I got into gaming with Skeleton Key about 20 years ago. I actually debuted my first products here at Origins in 2001, so 20 years ago. And then, uh, you know, I went on to work professionally as both a contractor and a creative director for a larger company, um, and about... Four and a half years ago, I just decided, you know, I'm ready to go back and start doing my own stuff. I have a million ideas, but often when you work in the industry, there are non-compete agreements and stuff like that, and I just I wanted to do my own thing. Right. I've had so many ideas that have been bubbling for years, and I'm fortunate enough to be in a position where I could just drop everything, make my own stuff, and have a blast doing it. Your art is so brilliant. I mean, I mean truly, and I'm not Thank saying you. that to, to pander. I mean, it really is so good it has so much depth the fact that you actually created your own language and the sheets themselves literally describe to you the abilities and the effects of the spell but there is no key that you have ever released to help decipher that language correct we drop little hints here and there but i did create a, a unique there's actually three unique languages because the druid spells are different than the divine spells are different than the arcane spells and they all have different rules the arcane spells are definitely the most complex, but we also, other than just word translations, we have symbols for wizard and enchanted item and a casting rune and a, a school of magic rune. And these all appear on different scrolls as necessary. So when I'm reading a scroll and, you know, so you've got detect magic, it detects whether an item is magic. So we have the enchanted item symbol on it with things like identify where you actually have to lay a hand on the magic item. It has the magic item symbol within the palm of a hand, right? To indicate that you have to touch it. In other areas, what is it, uh, dispel magic? We have them tearing apart that magic item symbol as they take the enchantment off of the item. I really did like dive in and try to whittle these spells down to their visual components and then just illustrate them and make them look like something you want to hang on your wall or, or, or you know, share with your party when they discover a treasure trove. I was speaking to Laura, who is your editor, but also coincidentally your spouse. I was recounting to her what I want to do, and she said she's had this happen where a wizard gets handed one of these scrolls and you're just like, well, fuck it, figure it out. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> right? You can translate it. The, the only clue we ever give is that the name of the spell is generally featured prominently on the scroll. So you can use that as a starting point to cipher the letters. Now, in the game, you have things like read magic, which are total foils for that. So yeah. you just say, this is some other arcane language that your magic, you know, you play with it. You've got, your, your, your PCs have got to be willing to go along with that kind of stuff. I think in my world, you know, mag magic is so esoteric and restrictive that identification magic and read magic stuff, those are the most restricted. Well, I will tell you this, those are also the most popular scrolls. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so players might not think that. <laughs> so if somebody is not meeting you guys in person on the convention circuit, if they want to find your material, they can go to skeletonkeygames.com. Yes, we have, a, we have a store, we have a blog that updates with the latest news, where we're going to be, what we're working on. All our materials are either on our website. We also have a few lines that are available in PDF or print on demand only, which are available through drivethroughrpg.com. But all those links are on our website 
at SkeletonKeyGames.com. I don't want to sound braggy because my podcast isn't huge, but something about Australians, they love Midwestern gaming podcasts. It's friggin' oh, wow. nuts. So do you ship internationally? Absolutely. And especially if we're talking about the scrolls, they ship in rigid envelopes and they are very reasonable to ship around the world. We have had a lot of luck and a lot of people are actually like, wow, you know, you can ship this to the other side of the planet for $18? Yes, we can. With the books and stuff, it gets more expensive, but we will ship it. I don't want to get too into it because it's not, it's not my place and scandal. Gossip is what I do as a hobby, not as this hobby. But you and I were talking and you're kind of a big deal. Like I didn't realize that you were, <laughs> yesterday I was wearing my Thagroth t-shirt. I didn't talk to you much yesterday, but the day before, I didn't realize that you spent some time working for Privateer. Yes, uh, I was the creative director for Privateer Press for eight years. I worked on creating Epic Thagrosh uh, with the team. Um, I oversaw illustration, art direction, graphic design, sculpting. I had an amazing teams there. And, and yes, I came from a fandom behind War Machine. Like, I, I love, love War Machine. And, and I was lucky enough to get to spend some time there actually crafting those worlds and those characters. You're fantastic. Your presence as a person, your booth presence, your art, everything. I mean, secret sauce just keeps coming out of you. So I realized a long time ago that I don't do a lot of things really well, so I just focus on the things that I do do really well, and it keeps me going. Saying everything else that you don't see here at this booth, I just fumble through life. You're firing on all cylinders here, man. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, a cruise sounds like a blast, but what if I had something else in mind and I wanted to do destination gaming, where we were actually gaming in a castle somewhere in Europe? Oh, you want to do that? Well, you can do that. You just need to reach out to RPG Travel. Jonathan is the game guy and his business partner is the travel agent, and they book destination gaming vacations. If you're a regular listener to the show, you know that I was for a time a game master for money back when third edition was popular. And so walking through the hall here at Origins, I actually saw them at Gen Con as well, but didn't have the opportunity to chat. I'm with RPGTravel.com. If I'm interpreting things correctly, you literally travel and then do role-playing games in a destination. But Jonathan Adams here is going to explain the RPG travel gaming experience for us. So we write custom adventures and we take people around the world to play them. And the whole point of our company is for experience gaming. So we take people into unique places like caves and castles and mines and those kinds of places to play tabletop games. Mostly Dungeons & Dragons 5e because that's the 800-pound gorilla right now. Everybody plays. But we do domestic, we do international, and you can get a sense of what it's like to to play in a 20,000-square-foot barrel-vaulted dungeon or deep inside a cave or, again, on top of a castle parapet looking out over Ireland. Our adventures take you to all the cool places in Ireland or Romania or Norway or wherever we're going, so you get to see the things that you want to see when you travel, but you also get to game in really, really cool places, castles and and a 400-year-old pub in Dublin and and so on and so forth. At risk of sounding critical, I've noticed that they're uh, domestically... If I'm looking at the United States, I don't see little icons, but I assume, obviously, as you already said, you do domestic. Is there anywhere in the United States that you don't have a presence? So we add new things all the time. Most of our one-shots in the States have come from people saying, oh, you should check out blank. We go, okay, we'll go check it out, and then something comes of it. We're based in central Kentucky, so everything sort of spiraled out from there. We have a couple different places in Kentucky, Indianapolis, southern Indiana, Columbus, actually, there's a place here in Columbus called Olentangy Caverns that we can do. So we have venues kind of as we go around the East Coast. West Coast is a little newer for us, so we're kind of expanding out there. But we have some things on our website that we'll be adding date-wise further out West as well. One of the challenges out West, obviously, is everything's further away. So drivable locations become more challenging. But then we have the international things like Hawaii is out is upcoming and we have something set in uh, Belize. So we'll be doing a Chult themed adventure in Belize. Uh, again, 
10 towns in Norway and uh, a dark sun campaign in Northern Africa. Those are the kind of things that we're working on for 2022 in and 2023. How did you start? So my partner Alex has been a travel agent for since 2009. So he takes you know groups all around the world, hundreds of groups, 40 destinations and more. Gaming was something we added on a little more recently. I've been gaming since 1983. I'm the game master, he's the travel guy. And so we put those things together in 2018. Unfortunately, like the rest of the world in 2018, Everything blew up. COVID sort of stopped all of our plans in 2019. So we kind of put everything on hold. Now that COVID kind of has a little bit of a bright spot, we're hopefully coming out of it. We're starting to ramp our stuff back up. I think that, and again, I don't want to get political because that's not what I do on my show. But I was in a sushi restaurant last night. It was 1,200 square feet. And there were 10 feet inside the door where you had to wear your mask. It was filled to the capacity. Both bars filled, every table. And I was like... I, I've got my shots, I wear my mask, I get it, but it's pretty clear that people are ready to go back to normal. And absolutely, you know, people are, are starting to see again, the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. It, it isn't a political issue, it's just a reality that we have to deal with. But as we come out of it, people are going to start traveling again, and so we're sort of positioned to help them do that. As a Missouri boy, Missouri is covered in caverns. Mm -hmm. There's a, there are some great caverns and great camping. But on my wish list, I want to call a Cthulhu one shot in the bayou, like an Inspector Lagrasse adventure in the swamp. 100%. So uh, we do mostly D&D 5E right now because, again, everybody plays it. It's really easy to pick up. We have all kinds of ideas for other rule sets, other games. We're working on a trip to Boston right now that we're hoping to do a Call of Cthulhu tri you know, in Boston and around some of those older, you know, 200 year old places that we can do a really good horror themed campaign. For example, Chaosium is here. Mm -hmm. Do you guys work yet with any of the other publishers to set up specific adventures based around their products? So we do white label tours for other game publishers, distributors, and those kinds of things. So we can actually create a tour for a publisher where they can push it out to their customer base and offer whether that be a product launch or a reward trip for their really valuable customers where we can do those specific games in venues around the world. I have a friend who is independently wealthy. Let's say he decides, I want to book a trip. Here's where I want to go. Mm -hmm. And this is what I want to play. That's all the information I'm going to give you. Is that something we set up? Yes, so we will take that idea and we will build a tour out for that. Whether they want to bring the entire group or something they have a small group part of that trip, we can build it out and then help you find people that will fill that trip. We can go anywhere. Like I said, Alex has been doing this since 2009. He has contacts all over the place. He can put together venues and itineraries very, very quickly so you can see the important stuff in these cool places, but then play the game of choice as you travel around. I love the idea. It was maybe only 30% joke yesterday when we were talking, and I asked, where, where do I send my video and audio application to Game Master or to book a trip? And all of that is going to be at rpgtravel.com. That's correct. And we have, you know, our social links are there. People can contact us via any of the social channels that were out there. We're always looking to talk to people in the industry, DMs, GMs, gamers, publishers, all of that. We have something that kind of fits each of those little niche parts, and we can do some really cool tours for them. When my wife divorces me after she learns how much money I've spent at Gen Con and now at Origins, um, I may be knocking on your door for Thanks. a gig. Come on in. <laughs> awesome. Jonathan, thank you so much. Appreciate it. It's great talking Take to you. Take care. Thanks. Next, I popped over to Fragging Unicorns and spoke to Opti about their skirmish level miniature game that is heavily based on some kick ass sci fi cyberpunk Shadowrun stuffs. My next stop was Fragging Unicorns. That is, fragging is into frag or slay or kill or mutilate those delicious, delicious creatures. Fragging Unicorns has gangs of the 
the Undercity, which attracted me because, well, I love toy soldiers, but more importantly, when I first saw these guys, they were actually being used, their miniatures were being used by Catalyst Games to play Shadowrun 6th Edition, because Shadowrun 6th Edition lends itself toward playing with figs. But I am going to let Opti, that's O-P-T-I, like in optical, I'm going to let him suss out what Fragon Unicorns is for us. Uh, so Fragon Unicorns is a response to the things we don't like about gaming, and we just decided to make our own game company because we wanted to put great things, a lot of love and a lot of care and a lot of compassion, a lot of treating people right back into the world. So And so you decided to name the company Fragon after Unicorns. killing unicorns. Well, <laughs> fragging, like lots of other different F words, can go lots of different ways. So oh, okay. our fragging unicorn is a fragger, not a fighter. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I love it. Your game, Gangs of the Undercity, well, as the title implies, and as I've already suggested, is very futuristic, cyberpunk, Correct. shadow runny. That's the general vibe you guys were going for. Yeah, essentially there was a, uh, well, as you mentioned, Shadowrun earlier. Um, Shadowrun had a miniatures game planned for 2012 and uh, it sort of never materialized, so we decided, hey, why don't we make that? And since Shadowrun, the cyberpunk fantasy didn't have any particular minis, we decided, hey, cyberpunk fantasy minis, we can do that. So we love Shadowrun, we love minis, we thought we'd make the game that we wanted. And that's where we got Gangs of the Undercity. What distinguishes Gangs of the Undercity from other skirmish level games that involve guns? Uh, <laughs> sure, there, there are a couple. Um, but essentially, if you're familiar with like Necromunda or uh, Mordheim, Warhammer, that kind of okay, stuff. Okay, now you said it, I didn't, because no, no, Necro no. Necromunda was the direction <laughs> yeah. that I wanted to go. Exactly. But when you're at Burger King, you don't talk about McDonald's. That's, that's correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but if you're familiar with war games, it's going to feel pretty familiar. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. So if you're used to those games, the, the basics are going to feel pretty familiar. But we do have uh, a couple of systems, for example, Straight Up Magic. Uh, our world isn't as dark, which we also are like, putting that light back into the world. But also we have a mechanic called Grit, and uh, makes Gangs of the Undercity a little bit like a resource management game. Every gang starts off with a, a certain amount of grit, represented by these poker chips. And that's your gang's will to fight, or courage, or stick to that kind of thing. Uh, when you run out of grit, that's it. That's how you lose the game. Uh, if you kill an enemy model, you gain grit. If you lose an enemy mo or lose one of your models, you lose grit. But also, you can do cool things with grit along the way. If you want to uh, increase the size of your fireball, if you want to make sure that your uh, sniper shot is more accurate, you can spend grit that's going to enhance your abilities. Not to use the parlance of Shadowrun, but we could call it karma. Uh, yes, you could absolutely call it that uh, if you wanted to. <laughs> Except when, again, that, that's the... That's the resource management. Right. Well, in my in my house, we'd call it karma because we were like, oh, I'm spending karma to do this. Fair enough. We would definitely want to skin everything as yep. Shadowrun. Yep. I mean, I would want Lone Star and as technology sure. and the whole kit and caboodle. But if someone is not interested in necessarily a new miniatures game, uh -huh. but just wanted to get miniatures for their cyberpunk style gaming, yep. you sell the miniatures independently as well. Correct. Yep. Cyberpunk fantasy miniatures is our wheelhouse. That's what we do, and we do it better than anybody else. Well, let me ask you then, if somebody is not going to see you on the convention circuit, where do we go on the internet to find Fragging Unicorns? Uh, well, you can go to fraggingunicorns.com, or, or you can go to Twitter, at Fragging Unicorns. Uh, we're also on Facebook. Um, you can't get Gangs of the Undercity right now because we still have to fulfill to our uh, international backers and we promised that we wouldn't sell it you know, in our normal retail stuff and uh, on the internet until we fulfill, but it should be only about a month or two can get it. Do you guys manufacture internationally or domestically? All of our uh, minis are in manufactured in Indiana. I don't know if it's CO-Cast or SIO-Cast. Are you familiar with the creature, the the, the machine they're hawking we, over there? We spent a good deal of time with the uh, CO-Cast. It's fucking folks. cool, right? It's fucking cool. cool. It, yeah, so. Uh, so we, yes, we, we do have US-based production, but that is absolutely something we're looking into for us. Uh, see, this is why I love the show, because great <laughs> minds and all that. Yeah. Well, dude, Opti, thank you so much for your time. You guys are busy. I'm gonna let you get back yeah. to it. Mike, thank you so much, right. appreciate you.
As you're about to hear, Sunday morning, I was walking around the hall before it opened, and this is when I had my opportunity to speak with Sam and Gwen from Runway Parade Games, the people who created the board game Fire Tower, the one that Brandon was telling us about in the Gen Con special. All right, so it's Sunday morning uh, at Origins. The hall is not open yet. Fortunately, I had the opportunity to stop by the Fire Tower booth, which has been so colossally busy the entire show. I wanted to check them out at Gen Con because Brandon told me about them, but again, they were so colossally busy that I had to take the opportunity to use my press pass to come in early so I could actually sit down and talk to Sam. So Sam, are you the genius behind Fire Tower? Uh, no, uh, me and Gwen are the co-designers. Oh, so you're so, both co yeah. All right, so yeah, we did it the whole Gwen, process Gwen, together. do you mind jumping in? Or, yeah, or you mean, I mean, I know some people aren't comfortable talking to the media, and I'm a divisive personality, so I know some people don't like to talk to me, so I get that. But so can you guys tell us, first and foremost, as a game, uh, what's the elevator pitch on Fire Tower? Um, Fire, yeah, Fire Tower, it's a two to four player competitive forest fire game where your only objectives are one, to defend your own tower uh, using real world firefighting techniques, and two, to wield the power of nature and the wind and the flames to spread the fire from the eternal flame in the center of the board towards your opponents, breach their tower, hit their back corner, burn down their tower, and continue your quest to be the last tower standing in the forest. I have it on good authority that you guys have a pretty slick game mechanic in that if I'm eliminated because my tower burns down, I'm I'm not out of the game, is that right? That's right, you come back as the shadow of the wood, uh, which is the spirit of the burned tower, and you get to continue to play if the shadows can manage to take down any remaining towers, they can still win the game. So there's always a chance at victory there. So then if I get burned out and somebody else gets burned out, are we then allies? Yes. You're an, ah, your, okay. your team. So there, there's certain games of Fire Tower where people walk by and they're like, well, which tower won? You're like, technically none of them, they all burned. But the <laughs> shadows have won a moral victory by a kind of okay. It's a very, well, it's a dumb question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. When I come to shows like this, yeah. some booths are dead, some booths are constantly packed. You guys, not only do you have an attractive presence in terms of the production value of your game, but the slick way you've got your booth set up is very cool. What is it about your game that is so attractive to board gamers? I mean, honestly, I think a lot of people, if I had to pull people for why they initially came in, they're always like, I saw the glittering gems and the piles of fire, and what is this? And then they hear it's a competitive forest fire game, and they've never played one, and they want to try it out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know. I, I think uh, the components kind of draw people in, and then they're kind of like, oh, what is this? And then uh, they're intrigued by the theme, and then they want to sit down and play. Runway Parade Games. Is yeah. Fire Tower your first game? Um, yes. Yeah, this was the, yeah, the first game. Uh, I mean, not the first game we made, but the first game we actually produced and pushed all the way through. Some people, if they are not, if they don't really understand how difficult it is to break into the hobby and to get something successful, right out of the gate, people might look at it and say that you got lucky. Now, me, as somebody who's yeah. got you know, many years of retail experience and I've been to many of these types of conventions, you can see the tremendous amount of effort and hard work that um, went into this. Thank you so much. <laughs> I think it's a lot of both though. We definitely did have some luck as well. So many people have helped us out along the way and people have been incredibly supportive in our project. So without them, we never could have done that. Your experience as designers and then becoming professionals, it sounds like you have had a good experience in the game industry. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, everyone's always been very helpful with their knowledge when we first came in and knew nothing or even how to demo our game. The first convention we went to, we didn't even know that we were supposed to show people how to play. We thought they were just going to look at it and then walk by. And someone next to us, thankfully, uh, like leaned over uh, and was like, hey, I'm going to show you the ropes, and this is what you're supposed to do. Okay, how many conventions have you guys been to? Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, Oof. I don't know. We 30? Have, uh, 40? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe more. We, we have a count somewhere because I keep all the all the badges. I have them like hung up on the wall on a peg, but it's starting. Uh, they're starting to fall off at this point. Yeah. Um, but I actually, I couldn't tell you exactly how many at this point. Do you guys have aspirations for additional games and expanding? Yeah, we're working on, um, we have a game that we're working on now, Punch Bowl, which we designed during the pandemic, and this is the first time we've been able to play test it at a convention, so we're hoping uh, to bring that to Kickstarter sometime in the future. So then, Fire Tower, it looks like it was funded in under two hours on Kickstarter. Yeah. But, so that's all closed. If I want to get the game now and I'm not at a convention, where am I going to find you guys on online so I can order the game? Uh, yeah, we're Runaway Parade Games at runawayparade.com. 
any idea when we should look out for the uh, punch bowl Kickstarter? Um, we move at like a glacial pace. <laughs> so, I don't know. We end up being perfectionists. We don't want to like put something out until we're like, completely have all the mechanics refined. But hopefully, sometime in the next year or so. And if you're interested, sign up for our mailing list, and we'll let everybody know. Your booth is slick. Your game is slick. It's just amazing the effort that you guys have put forth and. I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk to you while there weren't actual consumers in here. Because I know when that gate opens, I'm not going to have the opportunity to talk to you guys because you've been crushing it. Oh, thank, thank you so much for your time. Oh, anyway, thank, thank you. you for it's great to, to talk to you. All right. Our final segment for part two is Sean with Mooney Bin Entertainment. He created a board game called Tomorrow Dies Today. I'll let Sean explain it to you, but if you've got any exposure to 007 whatsoever, I think you can feel the vibe of the board game. Also, well, you know what? Listen to the outro and the warning, because Sean was the subject of the extra clip at the end of the episode. So then, if I walk by Bridge Distribution, I'm going to go home. I've got a long drive back to St. Louis. But the genius behind Tomorrow Dies Today, Sean himself. Oh, you heard me sing about Sean. You did. You did hear me sing about Sean in the After Dark special. That's absolutely true. So, Sean, how are you this morning? I am feeling chipper. How about yourself? Man? I am awesome, man. I am, I am old enough and wise enough that I drank plenty of water last night, so I do not feel like hell. Because we are professionals. Yeah, no, for <laughs> sure, man. For sure. So, I wanted to stop by. I mean, I, I'm familiar familiar with bridge distribution i love toy soldiers i went through this whole thing with somebody else on uh, on friday honestly what i'm concerned about or interested in i should say mm -hmm. is your game tomorrow dies today what is the pitch the quick pitch all right so it's a game of strategy negotiation and world domination we have three different game modes so if you want to play cooperatively with your friends you can you can do team versus team for more traditional experience but the flagship of the game is cutthroat so you have four to seven players where one guy's playing the supervillain, he has no pieces on the board, has to operate completely through the rest of the players by influencing them through bribery or threatening them to get them to do what he needs them to do. The rest of the players are forming temporary alliances, but eventually have to break out from the pack because whoever gets the most VP by the end of the game wins alongside the supervillain. Do you know what VP stands for? I do. Yeah, victory points, I presume? Villain prestige. Oh, <laughs> villain, of course. I stepped right into that one, too. Thank I you mean, for you, my you, laid you, trap. No, you put, I mean, like, the bear, I could see it, and I just stepped right on the plate. Everybody does. <laughs> that's my favorite part of the pitch. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. Is the game available? It is available. We kickstarted last September, and I know you're, people are going to think there's an audio glitch on this, but we fulfilled three months early. So we kickstarted last September, succeeded, fulfilled a few months ago. Now we're distributing to bridge distribution. We have nine metal minis in the box that all come standard with the game. Uh, we had no stretch goals. We didn't hide anything behind paywalls. Everything was automatically available uh, right up front. Pretty much, if I go to uh, my FLGS, provided they have distribution with Bridge, I can get the game through them. Absolutely. What if I don't have access to an FLGS or they don't have a deal with Bridge because as a former retailer, I know that the distribution game is difficult and with self it's getting even more and more challenging for people. So it is. It, do you sell direct to the consumer? Not that I'm trying to circumvent Bridge. I just want to make sure people have access to your product. Yeah, absolutely. So um, obviously go through Bridge if you can, uh, and your local FLGS, always support local. Mooney Bin Entertainment. Uh, Mooney is my last name, M-O-O-N-E-Y, B-I-N, entertainment.com. We'll sell it to you directly. Uh, you can also just search Tomorrow Dies Today. We have how-to videos on YouTube that are easy to find, and my website, so I've got all the information on there. Yeah, and so I was talking to Sean last night, and when Ted pitched it to me, he basically said... You know, imagine a Bond film, but flip the script, mm -hmm. and you're playing the villain, which that's super amazing. But what is our basic gameplay like? I can see you've got you've got some nice die cut components. You've got some slick miniatures with it. Cool. I'm assuming that these character cards are each for the individuals, right? Yep. You have nine asymmetrical characters. They're all the archetypical villains and everything. So you have the hacker, the assassin, the face man, all that other fun stuff. Uh, and again, the beautiful metal, metal miniatures, which I love to brag about. The basis of the game is you have some hidden movement and negotiation where you kind of put pieces on the board, go out, and your objective is to kind of solve puzzles. Are you familiar with Lords of Waterdeep? Intimately. All right, so for those who are not familiar with Lords of Waterdeep, where there's a very similar kind of parallel mechanic, where if you want to complete quests, you have to recruit like fighters or mages, but you're locked into how you solve that problem. 
With this game, you can recruit faceless henchmen, and you can assemble stats however creatively you want, and you can figure out the most efficient way to solve the puzzles on the board. And then you start gathering resources and recruiting faceless henchmen and trying to build up your own little private army, basically. Not only was it a blast hanging out with you guys last night, but a, just a delightfully cool idea, man. Thank you so much for your time. I hope you have a great rest of the show. Yeah, thanks for coming by. All right, man. Thanks, Sean. Well, I hope you've enjoyed part two of the Origins special. I've got a little something extra after this, if you stay tuned. But I want to warn you, there are two terribly, terribly awful things that you're going to be exposed to. One, I drop a C-bomb. And two, I sing quite wretchedly. Don't you know I've been Rickroll twice? First it came from a staircase, and then it came from a guy named Sean. He is a game designer working with Bridge. His game tomorrow dies. It dies today, motherfuckers. That's right, it's like James Bond, but we flip the script and you play the villain. That's your guy. That's your guy. You down. I'm gonna sing my songs cause I love it. I think that shit. It's fucking genius. I want to kill James Bond and his goddamn friends, and especially Q, because that damn cunt thinks they're superior. These eyes of time when I'm not really wondering what is going on, because I'm not the guy.